it does. I was like, <laughs> what's the deep symbolism of this? Is the driftwood going to show up in the Bahamas too? Like the shark, you know, hitched a ride on the driftwood all the way I down forgot there about that. Something. Yes. It, yeah, it's, it's like, well, this, this all happened because of this driftwood <laughs> okay i mean i feel like we should have had that shot after sean died maybe that's the bigger event here not ellen's visiting the bahamas no no this person died uh, it's, yeah. the, it's the bigger event but okay driftwood is a real problem in our world today sharks <laughs> love to hide underneath it <laughs> so um, uh, over on movies films and flicks mark has written an entire article uh, about the uh, the journey that the shark takes in Jaws of Revenge, if it is indeed the same shark. Uh, so I encourage listeners to go and, and read that. It's uh, it's delightful. It's, what, what, the kind of thing Mark does, he just takes an idea and runs it to its furthest point. And uh, yeah, he does a great job with that. So we'll, we'll, he's got a full timeline for the shark's movements. Um, <laughs> so on December 19th, the shark sets a, boy, a buoy trap and kills Sean Brody, <laughs> which... It raises a good point. How many traps has the shark set? How long has it waited? Is was this the first time that the shark tried to set a trap to kill kill Sean? Because uh, yeah, actually, I, I meant to talk about this. Cause... It had to. It had to wait for the the Christmas program rehearsal so that his blood curdling screams were drowned out by the kids singing. Yep, and it had to uh, incapacitate the the uh, coast guard in some way. It had to cause another commotion elsewhere big enough for the entire Coast Guard to be dealing with. How it got the guys to do the cow tipping, I don't know. Yeah, the other cop had to be out doing the cow tipping, so the shark has, you know, some some kind of helpers that are in on the cow tipping thing. <laughs> the, the, the cows are in league with the sharks. <laughs> they're all working together. This is a, a pro-vegan a shark film. movie. <laughs> cows and sharks versus the world. <laughs> Whoever wins. We lose. <laughs> we lose, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so they fly a small plane to the Bahamas, and who's flying the plane? It's Michael Bloody Kane. Michael Kane. Who of does course. not get a big reveal shot. There isn't, like, he's just he's just in the scene. I was expecting, like, this is this is Michael Kane. This is the year he wins. He's an established movie star at this point. I was expecting it to be, like, a, you see a silhouette in the distance. The light, light hits the face. It's Michael Kane. <laughs> but, um, but no, it's just, hey, it's insane. Yeah, well, he doesn't get a dramatic entrance, but he does get to act bat caca crazy in the scene because he's <laughs> like, hey, guess what? You know, let's let's just make the plane go up and down and up and down. And the little girl thinks it's great, but all the rest of them are like, oh, my gosh, this guy's a madman. The houses bit, get bigger. The houses get smaller. <laughs> but, again, I... I, I... I'll watch Michael Kane do anything. Uh, I thought that was that was a nice little touch. I can see somebody who flies these small planes doing that kind of thing. Apparently, there's a, a deleted <laughs> subplot where he is like a drug runner. Um, <laughs> which they did not include in the film, um, and like explains the gambling debts that kind of thing. Uh, so he's a bit of a, a sordid character, and they they reduced uh, the level of how sordid he was for the for the film, which fine yeah well and can we talk talk about his name i mean <laughs> yes I, I, if you if you know we we've done it before on on you know like lamperty and stuff where you one of the categories is you list character names and then we have to guess who played all those characters and i never would have in a million years remembered the fact that michael kane once upon a time played a character called hoagie hoagie newcomb is his full name uh, yeah, just made me hungry because a hoagie is the name of a sandwich. You know, <laughs> Apparently so. So the only other hoagie I know of is Hoagie Carmichael, which is spelled differently. Who is in the best years of our lives? Uh, he's ah. a piano player, and he was one of the basises of James Bond. Apparently, if, if you read uh, some of the James Bond novels, he's described as being a Hoagie Carmichael type. Hmm. So his full name is Hoagland. H o a g l a n d. Hoagland Howard Carmichael. Hoagland, a name I have never heard until I just said it. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's much more of a Michael Caine type of a name, though. Hoagland. Why well, you yeah, say I that? Mean... But like, it's, it's he's playing an English character. I was disappointed. I was like, ho kind of hoping that he'd be playing, he'd be trying to do some kind of an American accent. Because yes, he won an Oscar for doing an American accent in the Cider House Rules. I think. Is he American in that? Either way, he's he's not 
his usual. He's uh, a he's an American and Hannah and her sisters, I think. I don't well, I don't remember now. Hmm. Well, I just he has such a distinct. He's like Sean Connery. He has such a distinct accent to him that when he ever, whenever he does anything else, it's noteworthy. And so I was kind yeah. of hoping, like, is he going to try and do American or heavens forbid Jamaican? Okay. <laughs> hey, he would have done it better than Mario Van Peoples does. I'll tell you that right now. Yes, one hundred percent. So, but yeah, uh, H- Hoagland or Hoagie to me is is not an English sounding name. It's it's I say a name I've never come across. Uh, so I don't like just searching for the name Hoagland only brings up people who have it as a, as a surname. So. I don't, I don't know what we're doing. Like this is, it just feels like the name Hoagie. It's like actually you've talked about this on other podcasts before. After uh, Splash came out, people started being right. called Madison. Madison. Yes, yeah. I remember because I, after I listened to your podcast on Splash, I then saw a film which had like three people called Madison in it who were all would have been born before Splash came out. And I remember thinking that with my arms folded, saying like, "Nope, that wouldn't happen." Todd told me about this. They didn't start getting called Madison until after Splash. <laughs> <laughs> so this feels like it's it's a movie name, just calling somebody Hoagie to me. So you're saying that we missed out on the wave of young boys being named Hoagie in, you know, 1988, uh, you know, a year or so after this movie came out. Maybe, yeah. I, that's It's something the the culture has never fully recovered from, I would say, is, is the lack of mm. people called Hoagie. Uh, but just, it, feel, it feels more like a name you give a fictional character rather than the writers of this film knew a guy called Hoagie Newcomb and they wanted to pay tribute to him in this film. It's just, it's, it feels like a very right. fake name to me. <laughs> uh, which, <laughs> fine. <laughs> if it's his character, he feels like, a, uh, I liked him in this. It's, it's not a lot well, of his character. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I had to wonder a little bit just, well, you know, he must be independently wealthy or something. I mean, you know, what, what, uh, you know, did he do in his former life that he can now just go down and live in the Bahamas and ride around on his little fishing boat and occasionally fly a plane and, and, you know, hit on old women that come down from Amity Island. Or is he running away from something? Is he trying to stay away from England? Um, Mm -hmm. Because, you know, people there, that's where he owes all the money. Like they say in the film, he has to keep flying the plane for the rest of his life to pay off all his gambling debts. And then later in the film, he loses much more money and seems okay about it. (laughs) (laughs) And he has a perm. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> this is my, my, my wife's biggest complaint about the film was why does Michael Caine have a perm uh, so, <laughs> I had no answer because it was 1987 man perms were, were the thing Well, my dad had a perm for a while I, um, well it shouldn't have happened it's, this film proves it shouldn't have happened so, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah so they, they arrive in the Bahamas uh, Ellen and, and Hoagie kind of Make make friends on the plane. Hoagie proves he's good with kids, etc. Uh, he can be often found just uh, fishing off his little boat around the the area. It seems, and uh, we find out Michael's job is he, uh, he's doing some research on sea life, which involves tagging uh, hermit crab shells and just seeing watching what they do. Uh, he does this with with Jake, played by the aforementioned Mario Van Peebles. Uh, an actor uh, I'm unfamiliar with. First time I've seen him in anything is this film. Uh, so really, yes. Okay. What, what should I have seen? Uh, as far as I'm aware, I haven't dug into his CV. Uh, what, what else should I know him from? He shows up in a lot of things. I'm trying to think what you would have seen that he's in because, yeah, I mean, now that I think about it, I mean, he's in lots of stuff, but he's not like, you know, a list or whatever. He he was in New Jack City. Um, Let's see, Heartbreak Ridge with uh, with um, Clint Eastwood. That was just a year or so before this. He's in Highlander Three, The Sorcerer. <laughs> I uh, I call it a day after the first part of that uh, franchise. I'm afraid. <laughs> I've just been down his CV, and this is the only film of his I've seen. And t- I haven't seen any TV shows he's been in either. So, uh, yeah, this, this is my first and today only uh, Mario Van Peebles interaction. Mm. And I can't say I'm itching well, for a second. Uh, no, I, I well, I, I think 
I, if I had to give a worse performance of the film, I'm sorry, Mario. <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> the, the very first moment he appears on screen and the, the Jamaican accent is so labored. It's just <laughs> terrible. I mean, <laughs> I'm wanting to. I, I'm, I'm looking at this, going. I, I feel like I should be really offended <laughs> by this. You know. <laughs> uh, did, did they need to make him be a, like a native Jamaican for this character? Because like Michael it's, was obviously it's not somebody even who's the Jama- it's the Bahamas. Oh, it's, it's yes, a different my place. Yes. So because like Michael and his family, are obviously they've moved away from somewhere else, from Amity Island. So what's to say that that Jake Michael didn't Kane, as well? Of course, yes, not exactly. from the Bahamas. You know. Yeah. So this, this this feels like a choice that didn't need to have been made. But either way, he did, and the film suffers because of it. So, wonderful. You know who he sounds like? He sounds like the little shrunken head on the night bus in Harry Potter. And, <laughs> oh, uh, Lenny Henry. Prisoner of Azkaban. <laughs> it sounds like Lenny Henry doing putting on a very thick accent as well. Yes, I, yeah. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> uh, great. Um and we and we find out that uh, Michael's wife Carla is uh, a sculptor, and she's made a shark-inspired piece of art which uh, terrifies Ellen, even though it's very abstract. Uh, but fine. And also, uh, I really hate the dream sequences in this film because we have yeah. we have Ellen sees the sculpture, scared. Michael leads her away. Cut to she's out in the middle of the water. She's swimming. And we know right. this wouldn't and, happen because she's been telling Michael to stop going into the water. Everyone just stop being in the water. Stay away from the water. I don't want anybody in my family near the water. Cut to her swimming in the water. Yeah. And she, oh, she swims back. She swims back. Shark appears, eats her. She wakes up. And it's like, what the, what, what are we doing? Is it, I mean, get another dream <laughs> sequence. Michael has a similar one later on. And it's like, stop it. Just. <laughs> and, and yet, you know, that sequence is playing out. I'm going, I know this is a dream sequence, but there's a part of me that really wants Ellen Brody to get eaten. And then we just continue <laughs> on with something else here. You know, <laughs> that, that would be uh, an odd decision. Uh, I, yeah, <laughs> like, we've lost Sean. <laughs> now it's maybe she has a point because she's still going about the uh, the sharks coming for her. It's it's made a well, decision. And- See, that would have been a good way to just mess with people with all the marketing, because like I said, you know, it was, you know, Lorraine Gary in Jaws the Revenge. And <laughs> Briefly. Then, you know, have her get, yeah, have her get <laughs> killed off 20 minutes in, and then, you know, it's it's Mario Van Peoples against the shark or something. Like <laughs> yeah, it'd be very, very psycho, wouldn't it? Uh, yeah. I'd be okay with that. I think I'd be okay with that, yeah. Uh, so, Terrible Dream wakes up, Mario Van Peebles is annoyed that they're working late on Christmas Eve. He has a, a giant argument with the guy whose brother just died. And then immediately, uh, <laughs> well, immediately he then goes like, oh, I'm sorry. But he kind of realizes what's happening, what he's doing, and uh, takes it back. So that was, I, I did kind of believe all the interactions in this film. They all did kind of make a lot of sense from people. So to give the film its credit there. I can believe him being annoyed and reached the end of his tether. They go, oh, because of this guy, I'm going to work like Christmas Eve. And then he just go, I'm sorry. Sorry about your brother. I get it. Just, yeah. <laughs> that that makes sense to me. It's a very human. Well, moment. you know, because Christmas Eve is, is the peak of hermit crab activity. So they have to be out there on Christmas Eve working. You know, I mean, everybody knows that. <laughs> well, Todd, I don't know much about hermit crabs. So for all I know, that is true. So <laughs> <laughs> Take my word for it. <laughs> okay, will do. I, I live a thousand miles from any ocean. Take my word for it. Um, fine. Did you notice, like, there was quite a lot of talk about sex in this film. Between... Yes, there was. I mean, especially, especially uh, um, uh, Michael's wife just seems to be kind of obsessed with the subject. You know, every every moment she gets was like well i plan on having a healthy sex life well into my 80s or something like you know she's, she's and you know she, she's got her little art studio you know and you know that's apparently their special little getaway as well which i'm thinking i don't know given all the huge chunks of metal and crud that she's got you know welding tools i'm thinking i don't know that that's the most conducive environment for what what they're doing there well but he's always wanted to uh, so, to make out with a angry welder. <laughs> <laughs> that was a wonderful line. Um, uh, yeah, I guess fine. 
Um, but yeah, there was as I don't know if they were hinting at the kind of relationship here where quite a few times Michael and his wife have sex after he's just been looking at or thinking about his mother, which seems very Oedipal. Oedipal. 